midst of any situation, we can praise a good God. Amen. We're so glad you guys are here this morning. Before you're seated, shake a hand, give a high five, tell someone they look good. We are so pumped you're here today. Good morning, Go Church. It is so good to see you. Do me a favor. Let's put our hands together for first-time guests today. Also, anybody watching online, it's so good to see you tuning in with us this morning. Real quick, if this is your first time here, second time here checking us out, I want to direct your attention to the communication card. You got it on your way in. This has a bunch of different ways that you can connect with us. We're going to use it all service, but there's a place at the bottom where you can put some information. This is just so we can reach out to you, keep you in the loop with everything that's going on here at Go Church. You can drop it in the offering later on in the worship experience. There's also a place on the back at the bottom where you can fill out a prayer request. If you have one, our team prays over every single prayer request every single week. So if you have one, drop it on there. We would love to pray for you. Another way that you can stay in the know with everything happening at Go Church is by downloading the Go Church app. It's a really cool thing. We, we love the app. This has everything that is going on here is there. All of the events, any information about Go Kids right down the street, about Go Youth on Wednesday nights, everything is in the app. So you can find that in the app store on any phone. Again, thank you guys for coming to Go Church today. I'm going to give you a few moments to look over this communication card, download the app. It's good to see you today. We believe the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. We believe every word of scripture is chosen by God himself, but can we really trust the Bible? 66 books written by over 40 authors in three different languages across three continents. It took over 1,500 years to complete. So the question remains, can we really trust the Bible? Go church, do this. Look at somebody very close to you. Point at them and say, you are so smart. You are so smart. You are here. You're in church on a Sunday morning. The Broncos are going to win. You look amazing. I don't know about you. I'm excited to be here. I can sense the excitement. If you're excited to be at church, let me hear you say, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let me hear you say, let's go. let's go. You're in Go Church, man. You can say it here. It's the one church. You can say, let's go. Go. I need to ask you a very important theological question today. 
Have you ever been ziplining? Very important theological query today. If you have been ziplining in your life, can I see a hand, hand in the air? Quite, yes. Actually, leave the hand up and look around. We've got quite a few zipliners in the house. And I must say, it's not just this worship experience. The first one, it was like 90%. Ziplining, obviously, is a business I need to be in, maybe. <laughs> Becky and I decided to take our boys, Ethan and Levi, to Mexico a couple of years ago. And while we were on the trip, we thought, what great irresponsible thing to do other than ziplining. So we decided to go ziplining. So we show up. Now, this is in Mexico, and it looks fun. It's all tropical. We're above the trees. We're getting our gear, you know, our guide, super nice. And we're starting to make our way up the long climb, the ascent. And I will say this about our journey up, up the stairs. It's unlike some other zip lining or bungee cording kinds of places I've been to here. It didn't look like OSHA had shown up recently. Um, the stairs were a little... A little suspect. As we got higher and higher, it was kind of drifting, you know, in the wind. We started to notice uh, several cables that were attached to the top, going all the way down, you know, into the canopy to kind of keep it together. And it makes you nervous, right? So we're with a random family. They were nice. We're talking as we're walking and walking and walking up to the very, very top. And we get there, and the guide decides to pick the dad of this other family to go first probably because the guy just looked tough. I mean, just like a man's man, a beard, big muscles, looked tough, like you would not want to fight this guy. And so he picks this guy, and he's like, all right, come on up. And I don't know if you've ever done this where we've done it, but they went through everything super fast. Just ready to go. He's like, wait, wait, wait. I'm not ready to die this fast. <laughs> Explain it to me a little more. So this guy gets up on the platform, and there's zip, 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 boom, boom, right? All he's got to do is just pick the feet up, and he's going, baby. All he's got to do is pick the feet up. But this big, burly, tough-looking guy, he starts to get nervous. I see him. He's looking up, and he's like a construction guy because we've been talking. He's in construction. So he's looking up, which makes it worse. I mean, he's looking at, you know, are these things really tightened down right? You know, what's the weight capacity? Of When's the last time this has been expected? So he's looking up at these little tiny carabiners, you know, the little clips, the tiny little clips with the twist that you entrust your whole life to whenever you're in a rock gym, climbing, zip lining. He's looking at this, and he's like, mm, I don't I don't know about this. And then the family kicks in. And they're like, come on, Dad. Don't be a wuss. Like, they're calling him out. Like, come on. We're going to do it. It's so easy. Just do it. And he's starting to get scared, which is now kind of making me scared. I'm like, well, maybe this guy knows something I don't know. And so he's getting nervous. He's getting a little bit scared. And he starts to back up. And then he goes a full abort. He's like, I'm out. Unclip me. And the guy's like, are you sure? He's like, no. Okay, okay. So unclips him, and he backs down. So who was the next person in line? Becky. <laughs> Becky gets up, and she's like, Superman, clip, clip. <laughs> she inspires our boys. And we happen to catch a photo of Ethan leaving the canopy. Look at him. Here we go. I'm like, son, this look is too late. I mean, there's no rewind on zip lining, man. Once you go, you're out. You're out. I mean, look at this. Look at this tiny little carabiner. Probably less than 100 bucks. Who knows how old this strap is? Have you ever trusted your life to a few little things like this? It's a weird feeling. Becky and I have been skydiving. Weird feeling. Trusting your life to a couple of little straps. Bungee cord, a couple of little straps. Climbing, a little carabiner on belay. I mean, you're trusting your life to these tiny little things that you don't know much about. I don't know how this thing is engineered. I don't know the tolerances. I don't even know the metal. I don't know when was the last time it was serviced. I don't know. I'm just going to trust the guy. I'm going to trust the gear. And we made it all back. But for me, sometimes trust is hard. It's probably because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Like, if I'm watching TV, I want all the controls nearby. I can just grab them, watch whatever I want, just be able to, boom, I want to be in control. If somebody else has a control, I'm uncomfortable. 
If son has the control, Becky has the control, I'm like, can I, uh, can I see the control? I gotta get the control. I want you to think about trust. Trust sometimes is hard. Trust in relationships with other crazy human beings can be hard. But trust is everything, right? I mean, every relationship you really care about is based and rooted in trust. And you know it's so important because when it gets broken, oh man, it's just brutal. It's just a vicious thing for a heart to feel is that brokenness of trust. You know, the longer that you're with somebody, Becky and I, we've been married 22 years, our trust is stronger now than it was in the beginning it grows. I want you to think about that in your relationship with God starting in this series today. Do you trust this? Are you willing to clip in to this? To the carabiner of Scripture, your spirit, your soul, your future, your eternity, you're here, you're now. Do you really trust this? Really? Do you really trust this author? I mean, we love the Bible when it's all peaceful and encouraging and, man, I feel strong and amen to that. I love that verse. But then we run into things that are uncomfortable. And it's like, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, can I just take that page and kind of... And then, then I like it again because it's fun, easy. Do we trust the Bible like we trust even more so than we trust other normal, everyday things? I don't know if you've thought about this before, but you trust maybe more than you think. How much do you really know about the car you drove over here today? I mean, if you were to download the service manual, not the owner's manual, the service manual for your car, how much do you really know of this? You know how to drive it around, but you don't know about all the internal systems, all the electronics. You don't know all the things about the braking system and how it works. You know, but you trust it to work. You entrusted your kids to be safe in this car. You don't know much about this chair, but you're sitting on this chair right now. It should just hold you. You trust it. Why do we trust certain things and not other things? As we get into this series, we're going to ask a couple of questions about the Bible. Questions like this. Does the Bible claim to be God's word? What does it say about itself? What does it claim to be? Does the Bible seem to be God's word? Does the Bible prove to be God's word? We're going to ask some of these questions, and you've got to think about the answer for this. If you truly trust it and believe it and say, I'm going to live according to it, how should that affect my attitudes, my relationships, how I treat other people, how I treat those that I love the most? I mean, the ramifications of believing the Bible are huge, but also the ramifications for not trusting the Bible are huge. So I want us to grow in this. This series is going to be great. We're not going to do it all today. We're going to take a good first step. And I want you to grab a communication card. Write this down. It's our one big thing. Write it down right across the top. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Our one big thing today actually comes in the form of a quote from a woman named Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom and her family helped rescue Jews who were under attack by Nazis during the World War II, and they would hide them, try to keep them safe, try to keep them from being captured. This is a picture with her and Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a really influential, famous, amazing minister and preacher back in the day. My grandpa, William Blackstone McCoy, loved him some Billy Graham. Thought about him this morning. So think about this one big thing, this quote again, from her perspective. The fear, Nazi invasion, the fear of a big knocking, banging on a door. Never be afraid, from her perspective, to trust, from her perspective, an unknown future, as she was in a concentration camp, her and her family were captured, to a known God. Gives it a little weight, doesn't it? Wow. She's been through some things. 
If she's willing to trust, think about your own life. Are we willing to trust? What are we willing to risk to know and to follow and to trust and to grow? So today we're going to get into it, and we have learned some great things together as a team over the last year or two. We've dug into some fun things, some great stories. We've laughed. We've cried. We've We've explored some theological subjects like salvation, justification. We've got into some things like sanctification. We've got into some things like substitutionary atonement. And today we're going to get into some theological terminology and ideas about how God reveals himself to us. We're going to go big picture. We're going to think about God even before Bible. I mean, the Bible hasn't always been here. Humans have been here longer than the Bible. God has been here for Infinity. Just think about that, and your mind will start to like come out of your ears after a while. <laughs> I want you to think about this today. Trusting Scripture. What does God say about Scripture? What does Scripture say about God? Can we trust it? How does God reveal Himself to us? It brings us to our first term. I feel like we're in college together. Here we go. First term. This will be on the test. First term, general revelation, write this down. What God has made known of himself and his will in nature and in the human conscience. It's the idea of God showing himself to be real, showing himself to be true through nature. Now, how many of you guys love mountains? You love the mountains here in Colorado. Can I see a hand? You love the mountains, right? The mountains are calling and I must go. Unless it's a Sunday morning. You go Saturday, then you come to go church Sunday. The mountains are calling, I must go, man, I love the mountains, I love to ski, I love to snowboard, I love to hike. Our family just went to Estes Park, a little leaf peeping two days ago, rode some horses, I've never felt so old after that the next day, oh, but beautiful being out there, seeing Long's Peak, I love it all. But let me say, there are some people that put creation in an inappropriate place. When I look out of my back door, I see a great sunset. I see a great sunrise from the same door. I see some amazing mountains, and I love it. But let me tell you, it points to a creator. I love creation, but I'm not going to worship it. I think it's beautiful, but it tells me something about the creator. Some people worship creation. They've got it flip-flopped. I want you to think about yourself and your position. You've been created. Your kids have been created. When you see somebody else, in a sense, you see the image of God. Man was created in the image of God. It reflects the image of God. When we see nature, we should think about how amazing, how strong, how beautiful, how deep, how layered, how magnificent God is. So when I'm out, I'm doing all of that. I'm not just like, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, wow, look at that rock formation. I'm thinking about the complexity of and the glorious nature that is God, that is our creator, and for us to have an opportunity to know him, to trust him, nature says something about God existing before the Bible was even around. The Apostle Paul writes this. Check out this scripture, Romans chapter 1. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything... God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. What an amazing opportunity if you're a parent here of a young kiddo. You guys are going to school, man. You see a beautiful sunrise. You see a beautiful mountain landscape. Say, son, Baby girl, did you know that God created this? Did you know that God has created us? Did you know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? Just like he makes the world work and it reflects his nature and his goodness, he has something for you that's going to be beautiful. I mean, just think about the endless opportunities we have when we see something beautiful to bounce that credit to God. Say, like God's amazing. Nature says something. But it's not the only thing when we're thinking about general revelation that says, hey, God exists. God helping us know that he exists through many, many ways. So the other way is through human conscience. 
Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been two or three years old in your life? You ever been? Can I see a hand? You ever been? Yeah? As you're older, have you ever met a two or three year old? Uh, how many of you know they can act like the devil? <laughs> I mean, if there's ever any proof you need that good and evil exists, just hang out with a two year old for like eight hours. You'll find out real quick. You don't have to train them how to say mine. You don't have to train them how to like, now, here's how you obsess about your toys, okay? Here's how you do that. This is built in, man. Good and evil. But where does that come from? Let's think about this. This is Romans chapter 2. Paul writes, even Gentiles. Now, in this writing, his audience, Paul's audience, Jewish believers. So when Paul writes, even Gentiles, what he's saying is, Everyone who's not Jewish, everyone else, they didn't have our law. They don't know about our law. They don't know about Old Testament writings. He's saying even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. Just the fact that so many of us can feel and sense what's good and what's bad and what's good and what's evil, even if you don't know anything about God, says something, I think, about God. Now, certainly there are medical conditions and people that have been affected because we live in a chaotic, crazy world broken by sin. I mean, basically, in the beginning, Adam and Eve decided to do their own thing. That created a spiritual train wreck. The rest of the Bible is about fixing the train wreck. Okay, we just explained the Bible in one sentence. That's what it's about. Fix the train wreck. Learn about it. That we live in a fallen, messed up world through sin. That Sir, there are people who might not even feel that at all. But that doesn't mean that good and evil doesn't exist. Interesting moment, a college student posed an objection during a lecture, and I wanted to read this to you. So this is during a theological lecture on a secular college campus. The student pops up and says, there cannot be a God because there is too much evil in the world. Now, I really respect this question, and I think his response is good but we should never blow past questions like this. I think, in fact, we should ask questions like this. The more questions you ask, I think the stronger your faith is, and that's how questions work. The questions that you ask will either push you closer to God or further away from God, and you get to choose which. So in Go Church, we want to be a church that asks hard questions, right questions, questions that we don't even know all the answers to. But we grow when we search, and I want us to always be searching and always be pushing there cannot be a God because there is too much evil in this world. The student clearly believes there's evil in the world. The Christian lecturer responded this way, When you say there's too much evil in this world, you also assume there's good. When you assume there's good, you assume there's such a thing as a moral law, on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. But if you assume a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver. But that's who you're trying to disprove and not prove. Because if there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. What is your question? God has revealed himself to us in ways that are even outside of the word of God, through general revelation, through the things that we see in nature and the beauty of everything. It speaks to a creator. The fact that we can have a sense of right and wrong, I think speaks to a creator who is good. General revelation is powerful and it's great, but there's more. God didn't stop there. It wasn't enough. God in his wisdom said there's going to be more. So general revelation, we take that. We accept that, but we don't just camp out and live there. We keep pushing. And it leads us to another term, another zone of thinking that I want you to write down called special revelation. It's a theological term. 
That's what it means. God's revelation in the written word, the Bible, and in the person of Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. It's perfect theology. Everything that you need to know about God the Father, you can see through God the Son. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus is perfect theology. Everything you need to know to have an amazing relationship with God and to make this life work and be the person that God wants you to be can be seen in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the Bible. Now, this might not be everything that you want to know, but it's everything that you need to know. I think that's amazing. Jesus Christ, the Word of God. So what does the Bible say about itself? What does it claim to be? Is there something that makes it unique? Or is it just in the mix of every other kind of religious text or script or collection of writings? I want to share one scripture with you today. We're going to get more into this as time goes by in this series. But today, I want to give you this scripture, which I think is a great summary of what the Bible claims to say about itself. Okay? 2 Timothy 3.16, it begins with two words that I think are powerful. All Scripture. Help me out. Everybody say all Scripture. All scripture. I want you to think the whole thing, okay? Not just parts or pieces that you like. All of it. The things we don't understand, the things that are weird. Hello, have you read the Bible? There's some weird stuff in the Bible. It's okay. It's an amazing thing to figure it out. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you want to be outfitted, if you want to be equipped, it comes through knowing and understanding the Word of God. This is how you become equipped. Notice how it looks to itself to be the standard. We look at the Bible with this attitude. We go to the Bible and we say, how can the Bible change us? We never go and say, how can I change the Bible? I don't like this uncomfortable thing. I'm going to ignore it or pretend it's not there or make it say something that it can't say in context, in the totality of the Bible. I'm going to torque it, twist it, make it do some funky gymnastics to make me feel okay about a way I want to live and be with an attitude or how I treat somebody else. The thing I love about this particular scripture is it references the entire Bible, and then it says God breathed. Everybody take a big deep, take in some oxygen, all right? Take in some oxygen, then maybe chase it with some caffeine. God breathed. God's a creator. We've already established that the Word of God claims that God is a creator of all things including man. You know, God created Adam from the dust of the earth. The Bible is just amazing and weird and cool and awe-inspiring. I just imagine triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Creation is happening, and the Bible records that together there's this moment where God says, let's make man in our own image, plural. And so Adam is somehow, I don't know, whoop. That's the sound I get in my head. Or like the toaster's done or something. Ding, Adam's done. So Adam is there. I imagine his body just being there. And he's just there, but he's lifeless. He's still. It's just like just some inanimate thing until when the Bible records God breathing into Adam. And then I imagine his first, he's alive. It makes me think about how powerful and how alive the Bible is. Yes, the Bible is to be something I think we respect. And, and maybe you've seen, a, I got my biggest old Bible that I had around the house 
the one that looks like big Bible, gold, all the things given to me by my grandfather. This is writing right there before he passed away. I mean, maybe you've had one around the house. Maybe your parents had a big one, you know, in the corner. It's more than a big book with gold edges and fancy things on the end. It's more than letters and numbers. It's more than just sentences and paragraphs and, and books put together. This book, this is alive. Just like Adam went from kind of an inanimate object to whoo, alive. That is how the Word of God is. It's living. It's active. It's alive. It separates us. It helps us to know what's right and what's wrong. We can trust it. It is our lamp. It is our light. It doesn't change. It comes from an amazing Father. Do you believe that, Go Church? This is our rule. This is our standard. It's not changing culture. It's not the fads of fashion. This is what we judge everything by, is the Word of God. It's God breathed. Special revelation. The word of God and the life of Jesus. So God gives us the word, the word, and then God sends his one and only son. If you really want to mess your head up, go read John chapter 1 and think about the relationship between Jesus being the word, capital W, and this word, lowercase w in the beginning was the word the word was god the word was with god think about jesus being the word then try to think about there never was a time when god didn't exist uh, start thinking about all of that what we see about god through the life the death and the resurrection of jesus christ is perfect theology and if you want to know what jesus says about the bible Jesus has some amazing things to say about scriptures. If you want to know his attitude towards the scripture, what he said about the scripture, then be here next week. We're going to do that next week. Today, I want you to resolve asking yourself this tough question. Do I really trust the Bible? You don't have to change it today. You don't have to make some decision where you do a 180 or you're not good enough today. I want you to think about that question and let that spark a next step and a next step and another question. It turns into a conversation, leads to some prayer, drives you back to this thing, get into some research, and then you come back, and then you find out an answer, and then you're encouraged. Then you can help somebody else, and then there's another step. You are in the middle of your journey now. Accept that. Take that. What is the next step for you in coming to a place where you can really trust the Bible? Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We know enough. We don't know all, but we know enough. And God never calls us to a stupid faith, to an uneducated faith, but it is still faith. Even Billy Graham, who my grandparents adored, such an influential writer, speaker, minister, a minister to so many presidents of the United States. I mean, traveled all over the world. Even he had a moment early on in his ministry where he felt too much doubt regarding the Bible. He knew so much about it, but he ran into this zone of, man, can I really trust it? He came to this place of saying, I might not understand everything, but I will still trust. And he continued to grow and grow and grow and grow, and so can you. And getting us started, I want to point you towards a resource that I'm going to reference many times in this series. It's a website called The Bible Project. And I want to show you a video, an overview of the Bible. And I want you to think about one word as you watch it, trust. Trust, trust, trust. Let's watch this together. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, 
What is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians, who took them away into exile. Then, at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures begin to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible. What's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the Law. That's Israel's five-book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this Second Temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff, was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We've got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years. And from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. Everybody grab your communication card. Brings us to the one big action. I want you to write this down today. Very, very practical. I want to encourage you, download this app. I have it on my phone, the Bible Project app. 
and watch episode two. There's several episodes in this series about just knowing the Bible, understanding the Bible, the historical background of the Bible. I think all of this is really interesting. And the more that we learn about something, I think the more we trust it. I mean, isn't that true in our human relationships? If we were to go on a road trip that lasted six months, we would get to know each other a, uh, a very, very well. Because that's a long time to even think about. I'm like, wow, that's a long road trip. I should have went with a shorter road trip. Uh, two weeks? You might not like me after six months. The more you're with somebody, the more you know them, the more you know them, the more you trust them. Think about Jesus, his journey with his disciples. It wasn't just one year, in the two years, in the three years. I mean, think about that road trip. Think about those campfire discussions. The more you know about someone, the more you know about something, I think the more you grow to trust that thing or that person, the more you find out what they're like. This would just be a tool to help us learn more about the Bible and what it means. If it really is important, shouldn't we go at it harder than we've gone after an undergraduate, a graduate degree, a doctorate, our profession, the thing that you get most fired up about? I mean, shouldn't this be kind of top of the list to go after, to really get, to understand, not just something to like shelve and think about every once in a while? I mean, what if we went after it with an intensity that surpasses those other things? That'd be pretty amazing. Trust. Do you really trust the Bible? Do you really trust the author of the Bible? I want us to pray and ask God to help us trust. Here's the deal about trust. Some of you guys are going through challenging situations. And the more challenging the situation, I think the harder it is to trust because it is emotional and it's hard. You don't want to be disappointed again. It's like you're reaching out and that thing's got to work because it's a hard situation. Are you willing to trust God in the hard situation you're in now? And not try to just money your way through it or just therapy your way through it or just willpower and just be it and just like be stronger and be better through it? Will you really trust God in it? That same sense of maybe when the disciples and Jesus were out on that water and it was stormy and they were freaking out and then Jesus just speaks to the wind and he speaks to the rain and says, calm, peace, and it calms down. I just want us today to be reminded that we're not gonna put our trust in the boat, the life jacket, the tackle. We're gonna put our trust in the one who's in the boat with us. And that is Jesus Christ. He is with you. And that makes all the difference. He's not on the shore shouting theological instructions to you. Row this way. Row that way. Put your life jacket on while I'm safe over here on the shore. He is with you in it. Trust him. He'll get you through it. Let's pray. God, we come to you. As your kids, we ask you to help us trust you more. Help our faith to grow more. God, I pray for every one of my friends here today that are going through something hard, something tragic, something challenging. God, I pray that you would remind them that you're in their boat. They're not alone. They're not single sailors out in the middle of some storm. You're with them. And your word is a light and a lamp to our path. You guide the way. It is an anchor that will hold. And we confess that today, God. The most important point of trust and the most important relationship you could ever have or ever trust in is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here today, maybe it's been a long time or maybe you never have asked Jesus to be the Lord, the leader of your life. God will give you the strength and the awareness to make that decision today. If you're ready, you just feel that in your heart. The Holy Spirit of God helping you know this is what you need to do. This is the move you need to make right now. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. 
I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I'm making you the Lord and the leader of my life, and I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to grab your communication card and check that little box on the bottom. Make sure we have your name, contact information. We want to send you a little Bible study, help you get connected in a small group. Let somebody know you prayed that today. God is good. Come on, go church. Can we put our hands together and declare it? God, you are good. You're trustworthy. Come on, let's stand up. Let's push into worship. Come on, let's trust God. In the middle of that stormy situation, let's trust God. Lord, I pray that you would remind us in worship today how trustworthy you are. You've already proven yourself. Help us to remember what you've done. You've sent your son. I pray grace. I pray strength. I pray comfort today, God. Come on, let's worship today, go church. Let's trust him. Counting your status as nothing, the King of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me. Stop. 
everything that is not of you, God. And we pray it at your feet this morning, Jesus. We pray that you would have your way and have control in our life this morning, God. If more of you means less of me, then take it. God, and we give you all of our worship this morning, Father. We trust you. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
God, we love you. We love you today, God. Yes. We love you today. Come on, let's pray together. Just close your eyes for a minute. Think about a friend or a family member, a neighbor. Think about somebody that might be going through a storm, a difficulty, a challenge, and how it would feel for them to have a life preserver of trust with the Father. And let's pray for them. God, we pray for every person in our community, our neighbors, our friends, our family. God, everybody who's hurting that has that hole in them that needs so desperately to be filled with you, I pray that you would help us to be deliverers of hope, that we would deliver hope, that we would point people towards you, that we wouldn't just see your creation, but that we would be reminded that the creation points to a creator. God, I pray peace in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. I want to encourage you to grab your communication card today. Even if you're a regular Go Churcher, I want to encourage you, throw your name down. We like to go through these cards together as a team. We'll just pray for everybody who shows up. So show up. Write your name down. Write a prayer request down. If there's something going on in your life that we can help you with, partner with you with, if there's something happening that you feel like we need to respond to as a church, let us know. If you want to share an encouraging word, any way that you want to lean in, if you have feedback, write it down. We want to know. This is also the time we're going to worship God with our giving. And I want to just say this. Every week we say our mission. Let's practice it softly. Our mission is to live local live like Jesus. That was almost like creepy whisper. We should have went a little more than that. We did okay. But when we give, it turns our mission into reality. It resources. It becomes an economic engine to see God's mission move forward. It turns it into life change. So thank you for giving and for sacrificing. I want to close with this verse. Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I want this to be how we feel about the Bible, that it is a light to our path, that there is no darkness that this light cannot overcome. It's a light. Let's pray. Let's give. Let's sing with some energy. God, I just pray that as we give today, as we lean in together as a team, that we would remember that your word is a lamp and it's a light. We don't have to live in darkness. You have a way for us. So God, as we give, as we sing, as we praise, help us to remember that we can do it in the light of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up. Let's sing. Let's praise together as a family. One last there song. Is no There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Amen. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Amen. There is no rival. 
of despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in praise. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Oh, all of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break. This time we're going to be nice and loud. So let's say our mission together. Our mission is to live local, go global, and live like Jesus. See you next week.